Hello, and thank you for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to join you today. I will be discussing the implications of CRISPR to our discipline and make an effort to indicate where we are today. By way of brief history, I should note that the search for genome editor has been underway for some time, and for that matter, is still ongoing. At some point, we were dealing with so-called mega-nucleases, before too long with zinc finger nucleases, eventually with so-called tailends or transcription activated like effector nucleases. And then of course, beginning in 2012, we were introduced to CRISPR-Cas9 and its congeners. CRISPR-Cas9 as an endonuclease stands out in terms of its targetability fidelity, malleability, and versatility. It allows us to repair multibase mutations, but that requires the generation of a double-strand DNA break, which inevitably will be subjected to homology-directed repair, or HDR for short, which in somatic cells likely will require an exogenous DNA template, and in the zygote, possibly could rely on an endogenous wild-type allele. The double-strand DNA break, however, prompts a cellular repair mechanism known as non-HDR DNA repair mechanism, which is in short known as NHEJ which gives rise to small stochastic on-off target insertions and deletions, also known as indels, and to large on-target deletions and complex rearrangements. That is, of course, a challenge. To repair single base mutations, we generally can avoid double-strand DNA breaks by using so-called base editors which have the capacity to convert CG pairs to TA counterparts or AT pairs to GC counterparts. Altogether, as I have already implied, the CRISPR challenge is mostly about efficiency of editing, specificity of editing, and the uniformity of editing. Which brings us to editing the human germline and, of course, to our discipline. What is the objective of germline editing? Well, the objective is, of course, to prevent disabling and life truncating monogenic maladies. This is sometimes referred to as remedial germline editing. This also has sometimes been described as the conversion of chance to choice. This is, of course, a lofty goal, which in principle could rid humanity of the so-called monogenic scourge. What universe do we generally have in mind? Surely we do not have in mind to edit all the 10,000 or so human monogenic disorders that are currently listed in the online Mendelian inheritance in men. Instead, we are likely to focus on edit suitable maladies, such as peri and postnatal situations where peri and postnatal medical therapy is infeasible, where peri and postnatal somatic editing is ineffective, when PGD is inutil and in fact gives rise to a rate-limited embryo complement, and when the target allele is highly penetrant, singular, and ideally CRISPR accessible. If we ask ourselves today, what is the state of the art 
The answer would have to be nascent. And I'll come back to this point later. You can think of it as so near and yet so far. The story as regards our discipline begins on April the 18th, 2015, when on the pages of Protein Cell, Professor Huang from Sun Yat-sen University published a paper wherein he attempted to edit human zygotes, albeit triprotonuclear zygotes, which of course would be non-viable and non-transferable. He focused on the beta globin gene and secured low editing efficiency, minimal editing specificity, and limited editing uniformity. Hardly a major scientific success. Nevertheless, because of the novelty of it all, Nature did include it in its 10 people who mattered this year issue, uh, which came out on December the 17th of 2015. Two years later, the National Academy of Medicine in the United States issued a report titled Human Genome Editing, Science, Ethics, and Governance. And although it did not make major clinical recommendations, it did permit clinical research trials, but only for compelling purposes of treating or preventing serious disease or disability, and only if there is a stringent oversight system able to limit uses to specify criteria. On August the 24th, 2017, the first truly meaningful paper in this arena saw press in Nature from the laboratory of Dr. Shukrat Mitalipov from the Oregon Health and Sciences University. Therein, Dr. Mitalipov focused on the sarcomere gene, which gives rise to familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which as you know is incurable, is amenable to symptomatic care, and usually ends up in sudden cardiac death. Upon editing of zygotes 18 hours post-fertilization, Dr. Mitalipov reported editing efficiency of 67% and a mosaicism rate of 24%. When editing zygotes at fertilization, Dr. Mitalipov reported editing efficiency of 72% and a mosaicism rate of 2.4%, much improved. Target indels were noted in both cases. Dr. Mitalipov concluded that zygotic editing at fertilization enhances editing efficiency and uniformity, if not specificity, but that further optimization will be required if clinical application is to be entertained. Immediately post-publication, a number of critiques appeared on the pages of journal, on the pages of the Nature Journal on August the 9th, 2018. One of those uh, argued that the interhomolog repair in fertilized human eggs probably did not occur, and similar and additional comments suppress as well. Essentially, the critique focused on the questions, does the interhomolog repair, which was claimed, actually hold up? Have CRISPR-mediated rearrangements large deletions and loss of heterozygosity being missed by the authors? And has the hoped for wild type homozygosity been unequivocally documented? In other words, the paper left us with all kinds of uncertainties which had to be resolved later. Last year, the report came out from yet another commission, this time a commission that uh, was made up of the National Academy of Medicine and the Royal Society of the United Kingdom. That commission made several clinical recommendations. First, 
No attempt should be made to, quote, establish a pregnancy with a human embryo that has undergone genome editing. In a word, we're not ready for that stage. The other comment was, clinical use of heritable human genome editing should proceed incrementally. Clinical use of heritable human genome editing should be limited to serious monogenic diseases. And clinical use of heritable human genome editing must guarantee impeccable editing efficiency, specificity, and uniformity, as well as euploidy, and appropriate embryonic development. In a word, a very cautious report of the commission in question. As if to affirm the recommendations of the commission, a paper saw press later that very year, on December the 10th, 2020, in the journal Cell. The paper came from the laboratory of Dr. Dieter Egli at Columbia University, who studied the editing of human embryos. The main conclusions were that unrepaired double-strand breaks persist through mitosis and result in frequent chromosome loss, actual chromosome loss, and that off-target effects of Cas9 cause indel as well as chromosome loss. In other words, the impact of CRISPR on the human embryo thus far produces significant genomic changes all the way to a complete loss of chromosomes, which of course would be unacceptable, unworkable, and in need of resolution. Several other papers have also been posted on a preprint server that deal with the risks associated with the editing of human embryo with current technology. One was from the work of Kathy Nyakan from the United Kingdom, and another one was from Dr. Mitalipov, yet again, from Ohio, I'm sorry, from Oregon Health Sciences University. Neither of these paper has been reviewed yet and or published, or at least there is no public record at this time of these papers. So in summary, embryo-based clinically reliable heritable human genome editing is unlikely in the foreseeable future. Gamete-based heritable human genome editing using cultured stem cell-derived eggs or sperm may well prove to be the preferred route forward because it would provide for a far more controlled environment. It would not entail an embryo, it would entail a gamete, a gamete that is grown in a dish uh, of which multiple plates can be derived, and therefore quality control can, for the first time, be meaningfully, hopefully, exercised. So I thank you very much for your attention at this time, and I look forward to eventually having an additional conversation with you. Thank you very much.